So, Paul Cunningham. We're going to go in alphabetical order, apparently. Okay, very good. Paul, uh, <laughs> probably many of you don't know this about Paul, but I'm going to stay with this kind of sports theme <laughs> this, this evening. Paul was supposed to be in Brazil coaching the men's soccer team, and he gave up his career as coach to come here and work with us. I just want to give it to So, Paul, give up that lucrative career for writing. Yes, yeah. Aside from coaching a really third-rate world soccer team. <laughs> oh, man, Paul Cunningham is the author of a chapbook of poems called Goal Tender, <laughs> Meat Tender, get it? Um, Horseless Press, 2015, and he is the translator of two chapbooks by Swedish author, playwright, and video artist Saratus Efrik. Automania Selected Poems, winner of the 2015 Good Morning Menagerie Chapbook in Translation Contest. I was hoping it was going to be the Good Morning America, and I was like, wow, America's getting cool. Anyhow, and the, Knight's and, and the Knight's Belly, forthcoming from Toad Press this fall. He is a former managing editor of Action Books, as well as Action Yes, and he currently works as a contributing editor of Fanzine. And um, I was going to ask you a question. Do you speak Swedish? All right, our Swedish goal, our uh, soccer coach, Paul Cunningham. Thank you for that. Um, I'm actually going to... I'm actually going to start... Can everybody hear me? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to start by reading uh, one of my translations. Uh, an excerpt from the translation of Sarah's work that's forthcoming from Toad Press this fall, like Maggie said. It's called The Night's Belly. Um, it's kind of a Kathy Acker-esque uh, appropriation of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. It is about a woman with a uh, child, and she something has happened in the relationship, and she no longer wants the uh, she no longer wants to have the baby. And so this is an excerpt from that chapbook. A child's noise comes from behind, a festering wound of a noise. Life is a wonderful thing. Now she must take everything into her throat. Nature must be artificial. She imagines a culture without writing. She is inhabited by directionless objectives, bound to a life of insatiability. She needs to go even further into the forest. No breadcrumbs left behind. She follows a decapitated bird. After each footstep, a frost settles like a film over nature. On her journey, she finds an abandoned cottage with mullioned windows. The cottage is pungent and puffy, a redness that restricts your words, reduces you to tears, and inhabits you. Pull up your feet and settle into a little girl's room. Pull up your feet and settle into a gaping grandmother. Up with your feet and settle into the wolf's jaw. Sleeping thorn rose, zombie rose, thorn zombie, come into the skin. I read about a woman with fingers always covered in coke, constantly around the clock. Caterpillar crawls into my eye, an infection takes hold, sight feels lost, eye feels cut off. My color fades and I become useful again as another secret during makeup. Too many hostesses, too many sisters, visiting too much junk food, not enough fucking. Then the vaccine detox. For every step I sway, for every step a stagger, for every step a shaking. Here and after a free woman. Here and after every motion is like. Here and after the charred room expanded and the woman lost out on the street sausage stuffing. Here and after, soot and ash in my underwear. Here and after. Machinery malfunction, see footnotes. Mosquito buzzing. In spite of my thick skull, in spite of what seems impenetrable. Sir, sir, sir. I want to return to myself, my self, 
My secret friend is my writing, and she has been kidnapped. Secret friend is no longer a secret because I have lost myself. I actually derive pleasure from decaying rooms, decaying time, decaying figures. But I also maintain a certain distance and control over it. Now she is affected. Her mistress is affected. I am no one. It's not a secret anymore. Not a chore anymore. Not a secret chore anymore. I do not know who I am anymore. I'll go to zombie land to decompose. Gone soon. Away. No more. I write on my leg when there's no paper. When I'm half eaten and thrown out. Cliched. Faceted. Clear skied. Overlapping technology. Shattered memory. Fittings. Parts forced together. A puzzle that will never go together. And fear. A fear of falling. A foothold. An overlook. A place I struggle to apply myself. All is lost. Lost, I am mad. I am crazy, but you would never know it in between destruction and paradise. I have put all my words to use, spillage, mantra. I guess it does not matter. I stand on land without a foothold. I want my words, I want my thoughts, but even oneself is prone to theft. I stole my own language. I am my own thief. Who will save me? Touch me. Not you, flesh and spirit, touching myself, a touch-up, a mess-up, an end to Earth's red mothers. And uh, now I will read an original piece of fiction, which I plan to continue and work on here at UGA during my PhD. Uh, for right now, I think I'm calling it Report of Land, which comes from an Emily Dickinson uh, poem. Uh, I'll just read a little excerpt from the poem and then begin. But most like chaos, stopless, cool, without a chance or spar, or even a report of land to justify despair. Era, after internet, no escape sequences now, no idea what it means to be a human now, a human now, the word, the word now. No ideas how to live off the land of fishers, foam, molasses. No human idea now, I'm actually a demon cursed to aimlessly wander, cursed to collect data from this heavily skirmished earth, just a demon trying to keep a signal. I keep a cursor too, it trails me with its simophane glow, it hovers at my side like a canine might. Never know. Never caught a glimpse of a real live canine. Only pictures. Only scraps. Only a snout here, a tail there. Only a, plaw, a paw, a claw, a scrap. They bark and they chew me down, my thoughts. Earth is very much a scrap heap now where no canine grows. No human either. No way. No way to. I would know. I would. I'm a wandering remnant. Every day my being swells with the scatological pin numbers. What next, I ask myself. What could possibly be next for my Glaucus demon vessel and my little cursor pet? It's been a long wait so far, and only more waits for me, I suppose. More waiting among the crumbling ruins, more waiting beneath the cruel carapace sky. I wait with my hand pressed up inside the hollow of my cursor counterpart. The hollow flickers just rapidly enough to wonder how a heartbeat might beat. Just rapidly enough to distract me from the dead outlet ground, so cold and indifferent to my own odd beat. No grass to stain my scarred, blistering feet. No spoolings of grass to raise me up, up and out of the compiling carapace sky. It's a thick ice of a sky. The most recent ice age was a cold boot severely, and for many. These things have happened in the past, though. I did once pull and acquire a lengthy scrap from the thorny garlands of a gasoline-reeking library. Some texts are still legible as long as one can find ample lighting. But there's just no downloading some things. The 17th century was terribly long ago, but it did feature some terribly cyclical lows that the NASA one day termed the Little Ice Age. I still haven't located the definition of the NASA name but I have seen its four large letters many times. 
The NASA, I suspect, was an organization responsible for numerous attempts at warming the sky. However, based on the data I've collected, these attempted warmings haven't occurred since the use of the pin number specifically known as dates. Not to be confused with the expired food item that possesses tart and or bitter flavor properties. Most importantly, it should also be noted that based on my excessive logging of the current climate, such attempts at warming were a certifiable failure. Aggressive human activity of the past currently mirrors much of the Earth's current plant life. Plant life. I have long been cataloging the Earth's current plant life. The complicated botanical factions are a direct result of foreseen and unforeseen side effects via humankind's most prodigious industrial generations. The NASA used to launch finely grooved golden disks into the cosmos, hoping a someone, an alien, and anything could hear its promise of peace, its first movement, its ultrasounds, its cooing babes, its guttural uteri, its tractor racket, its clamoring railway, its horse carts, its morse code, its riveting riveters, its tweeting sheep, its blacksmith clang, its ripsaw pound, its canine treble, its spherical treble, its witch's brew, its rainy timber, its ragey frogs, its hyena cackle, its elephant gun, its howling hills, its game of marbles, its biggest bang, its piano mumble, its best good Johnny. The NASA used to leave a trace any way it could, but after all these days and dates I've lived upon this rock of noise, I've never understood why. I've never seen the UFO or anything else I've found in the junkie libraries. If ever I witnessed a space invader, it would be one of the tens of thousands of well-wired plants currently parting the ravaged lips of this planet. Among the ashen montacules I cautiously tromp, there thrives a bite-oriented protocol featuring always upgrading coaxial fly traps and in-connected triffids. The triffids are surely the most dangerous of humankind's past transmissions. Additionally, one cannot ignore the gift-projecting spider plants and the renegade pitchers loudly ejecting cursor bodies as if they were iams. Iams likened to landmines, a crosstalk that landscape scrambles. A walker like me should be obsolete. But here I stand still carefully scanning the plant life as it endlessly downloads, installs, processes. A thundering, gift-projecting spider plant swivels near me, projecting pornographed equipage, a museum of hollow, a sewage of titles, of notions of sponsor epifighting bodies perpetually drilled. On repeat, the eat, 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 a woman body hacked to repeat, eat, eat, a carnivorous tech bladder stretching, a stretch marking, a tearing, a never permitted to open their eyes in the limitless gift of limits, the limitless sewage of human. As a dedicated server, I tromp through the customizable menus and screens of constant angular velocity, the masculine mouth forever nipple slurping, the pair of breasts always rupturing into analog errors, the glitchy drill cop cash in forever pounding, the projected sexualities of the past breathed out by fiber optic swivelers, an autotrophic trending, a world's largest de desktop. Why go on preserving a trend? Finally housed, I stare into my new bunker's wall whites barren. From out of my encoding scheme, I gather materials for my interior presentation layer, highly necessary distractions, nine images I combed from out of an abandoned manor house. So many portraits, so many carbolic blooms of past trauma, nine images painted by a painter, by Velasquez. I've arranged them in three tiers of three. Top tier, Aesop, the coronation of the Virgin, the garden of the Villa Medici. Middle tier, Mariana of Austria, the triumph of Bacchus, the Infantana Maria Teresa of Spain. Bottom tier, Philip IV of Spain, Las Meninas, Prince Balthasar Carlos. Starving and barely dressed, I feel ashamed, humiliated by such paintings. I must say, I do believe them to be the closest thing I will ever have to music. Humans did very little to preserve physical music. I have only scanned the smallest scraps on music, but so little has still led to my occasional production of mouth sounds I would not have otherwise made. 
Does my mouth correctly imitate a piano mumble, I wonder? Does my mouth correctly imitate the go-go of a go Johnny go of the Johnny be good? Does my mouth do the gunny track? Am I capable of music? I cannot be certain. I constantly forget I am no different than the metallic weeds that snake like shackles below my body. A body of transmission rates forever under surveillance. Today, what a word. I stare into the black hole eyes of childish Prince Balthasar. He sits atop a fascinating creature known as horse. I stare into those tiny black holes knowing he does not know that he will perish at the age of 16. Knowing that he does not know his smallpox future. The little prince may be suspected he would live quite far into the future as a prince and all. And to my end of sight. I move to my left and I stare into the eyes of Bacchus knowing there is nothing left to drink. Nothing to piss, nothing to hold, not a single body left to caress, as one might have put it. Only this catalog. It is like a graffiti of madness engraved into my demon skin. I feel like the first program. I feel like the last program. Thank you. That was a great reading. I have two questions for you, though. Did you get um, the gods to conspire with you on the weather for that piece for tonight? Because it made me freak out. Um, I with my wet something. shoes and seeing the plant life in my yard before I came here. I was like, and why do you think the Swedes are so crazy? <laughs> I mean, I think, because I keep thinking, if we had free universities and free health care, we'd be totally happy. And, and then you look at Sweden. And the Swedes, the Swedes don't care about the breasts or nudity. That's fine. Well, Americans neither do the Germans, but they don't write like that. Americans hate nudity. <laughs> Anyhow, we'll have this conversation later. Oh, wait. All right. No, we yeah. have. Who's okay. next? Yeah, but I thought you had a story. On the street bench tonight. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I was born. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. And then I died. <laughs> you said story. Yeah, I was just oh. going. To no, I thought story. you had special Olympic narratives. Oh, I do you. have. I do have. Who's next? I was at a doctor yesterday. No. I'm writing it out there. Oh. Oh. Fake yeah. biographies for all the students. I did. I did. <laughs> okay. Um, Why do you have to videotape this? That's what I don't like. It's getting too much fun. It's not my idea. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're good. You got it? Can you tell us? Can you please tell us about Nathan Gethos? Jehoski. He's a husky. I can't do the Michigan hole. <laughs> hey, many of you in this room do not know that Nathan gave up a perfectly good and lucrative, I might add, career as a pro show skater before joining this program. And uh, he was all set to go to Rio, and when we called, he said, Wow! If I became a creative writer, I could get drunk, beat up someone in the garage. Think of the fun. I oh got it, and no one will care. <laughs> and still get a PhD for him. And still get a PhD. I could go to the AWP and it would be alright. <laughs> so he gave it all up to come here and be with us today. So, alright. <clears throat> Nathan Gahoski. Jahoski. I can't do it. Jahoski. Jahoski. Zarowski. Jahoski. We got it right. Zawacki. Zawacki. A first year. <laughs> We're making the men do this next year. A first year PhD student at UGA and recent graduate of Eastern Michigan University's Creative Writing MA program, Nathan Jahoski pursues an experimental approach to trauma and its effect in prose. Heavily influenced by the work of theorists like Michel Foucault, 
Oh God, why'd you have to put it? Gaia, Gaia, Tree, Chakra, Vortis, Spivak, is it Polish? Her name is Spivak. He struggles with ways to pressure or escape the confines of prescriptive or normalized representations with moments of trauma. His piece is a draft of a novel entitled On War. Deals in part with a moment of historical rupture during World War II when the Red Army invaded East Germany and the value of human life seemed to almost inescapably collapse. Please welcome Nathan Jahoski. Everybody hear me? How about now? Better? Better. Better? Better? All right. This Stalin is our Stalin. Our good friend Joe, in his brown shoes and pressed uniforms, his bushy eyebrows and thick mustache. He became my thesis in 02. His experience of World War II, a point of contact and departure for the work as a whole. Man of Steel, a complication of the history and character of I. Stalin. I opened with an anecdote. When Stalin found out about Operation Barbarossa, Germany's planned invasion of Russia, months in advance of the actual event, he wrote on the report informing him, you can tell your source from the German air headquarters to go and fuck his mother. This is not a source, but a disinformant. I felt it made the gravity of my project more severe, more tangible. To understand war, I wrote, one must understand fuck and Stalin and everything in between. The explicative, the frank candor of the marshal. Sharing a history I was trying to pin down, or maybe you just like the word fuck, Sarah said. You could be right, I said. I started writing my thesis the day Sarah and I got married. It was Good Friday. The venue was the cheapest one we could find. We drove there with our bridal party, smoking cigarettes and pot, drinking MGD and Paps with the Ribbon, and growlers of microbrewed stouts. We sat on the steps of the wedding hall, hours early, watching the skies, wondering if it would snow. Stalin the brave. Stalin the hero. Stalin the friend of all children. There is a famous picture of the marshal posed with a small girl who is handing him flowers while he gives her chocolates and puts an arm around her. This picture became a painting, then sculpture, and finally history. The girl's father died in Siberia. He was arrested and shot on the orders of Stalin, who kept meticulous lists of all those he wanted killed. I decided that day to keep lists of my own, of all the undesirables, all the things I would have changed if I were Stalin. One, the forward mobilization of Red Army units just prior to Barbarossa, allowing the Nazis to encircle and destroy over half the Russian army. Two, the suicidal purging of over three quarters of the officer corps in the 20s and 30s, resulting in a crippling deficit in trained personnel at the outset of World War II. Three, the presence of non-combatants, oh no. What? Sarah gesturing, blouse lifting, Band of thong peeking out from skirt, cayenne heat of skin a few inches away from hand or touch, a pinch, a nipple, a nipple, slipping up against me, painted nails on shoulders, lips, lips on neck, breath in ear, asking, should we say something? To who? Andy and Beth, they're fighting again, our best man and woman. Do you think we should say something? No. Well, let's not then. Okay. Four. Ugly suits, cheap brown shoes. I was going to write about Stalin's shoes, I decided, because of how absurd it was to picture terror in brown loafers, to imagine his generals and political opponents looking down at his feet, afraid to lift their heads, sure of what they'd find, reading the gulag in scuffed leather. Another anecdote with vodka and juice. We invited 40 people to the ceremony. Family and friends who arrived in good order to lean against walls, on tables, over credenzas covered with thick vines, drinking Bud Light and Labatt from cheap plastic cups, waiting for the show to start, sipping wine, pounding shots, signing our registry, talking about how good we looked together, how happy we were. It made, parent, it made Sarah's parents mad, though, our choice of date. They were devout Catholics, and I could hear them grumbling over all the meat people brought. Roast beef with scallions, fried chicken with chickpeas, herb roasted pork loin, bacon-wrapped scallops, 
slices of ham, honey roasted pecans with buttered potatoes and tossed salad mixed with venison and bear fat, some concoction of Uncle Tom's, that fucking Protestant. They left a taste in your mouth that watered for days, or Aunt Paula who brought a vegan casserole you just knew was a lie, nothing vegan smelled that good. You could taste it, the bacon, the beef stock, and again some herbivore, some leaf schlepping schmuck, some bush eating scat mincing animal you hunched over snarling to tear a hole in its chest and take its still bleeding heart into your mouth. Don't be so dramatic, Silas. I'm not being dramatic. You are. Okay, maybe a little. Our friend Margaret performed the service. She wore black robes and asked for vows. Sarah read hers with shaky hands. I navigated through mine carefully, avoiding the dates and notes I had written in the margins. Five, December 1942, Siege of Moscow. Six, Kursk, July 1942, Greatest Tank Battle. Seven, Sevitspool, October 1941, Hero Fortress of. Eight, Stalingrad, The War of the Rats. I never want to leave this day, she said. I do, I do, an alliance of sorts. Stalin in his bunker during the siege of Moscow, sleeping under subways, writing orders, not thinking how many millions, how many miles, just yesterday it was summer and the Germans were killing brown coats by the thousands, clearing 20 miles a day, giddy with success, unbeatable, the bear marks victory is another sign of Aryan supremacy, the Mongol horde, Mother Russia, the endless steppe where they grow men like wheat, where rivers stretch for miles, fitting into swamps the size of Tennessee, where one day is summer and grass and marching and nothing but the same, and the next is rains, the Russian monsoons, all October, day and night for weeks, the wear mark, a gray soap thing clogged with mud and rust, unable to move, incapable of advance, spinning wheels, broken axles, exhausted legs and calves and thighs, pushing timber slats under iron chassis, back sore, feet stinking, endless digging, trenches, latrines, shoulders cramped and splintered, waiting for the earth to freeze, the cold, the winter nights, carts and horses and tanks frozen over, waking to find toes numb and boots, stepping over naked friends, hauled together under blankets, dying of exposure, pissing off the edge of the front, endlessly deferred, always ahead, never behind. Mother Russia starting to push back, friction, the culminating point at which an army's reach exceeds its logistic means and everything begins to collapse ten. Sarah and I taking the dance floor, drinking champagne, stepping on toes, ow, sorry. Disco globes like sparkled visual migraines spinning across freshly waxed floors, sometimes in eyes, others in ears. Migratory apocalypse, advancing east. Are you glad we got married? Are you? Joe, impeccably slobbing, shrugging and pulling his boots back on, reaching for a drink. The marshal taking time to explain to me. It was human reaction, his fuck. Perfectly natural in the course of war. Fighting the whites, he said. I did much worse. Fighting the whites during the Russian Revolution, he did much worse. He once came upon a goat stranded on the Volga. The river was flooded. The animal was trapped on an island. Stalin swam to it. It had rained. The current was strong. The beast could not get away. There were onlookers, local farm women, some fellow revolutionaries. One woman had plump calves. I believe it was hers, the goat, he told me. Told me. I thought to rescue it for her, to see if she would give me a kiss, but it was young and soaked and frightened, and it bit his fingers and it nipped his ears, and when he touched it, it began to scream, and he was scared, he tells me. You understand, it made me frightened to feel this way. Fingers numb, face red, his skin clammy with exertion, eleven. Standing outside in the new falling snow, catching her breath, watching Sarah inside, waving from inside, moving table to table, more champagne, another vodka, smiling, nodding, hello. I'm not sure why I did what I did next, Stalin tells me outside. I had thought to put it over my shoulders, the goat, and swim back to shore. Sarah smiles, it bit me, she waves, it bit me on the face, cheers, it bit me on the face and made me very angry. And he was so tired and so frightened and so scared of the water, and this animal was frail and small and weaker than him, and looked up at him, and he knew he could do it, and he wanted to do it, so he did it, and didn't stop doing it until after he had snapped one leg, until after he had broken one of the goat's legs and started screaming for real and kicking and bleeding, and he laid himself across its middle, pinning it to the grass, and he broke the next leg at the knee, and it was pissing and shitting, and he laughed and broke its ribs and picked it up so he could do the rest in the air, swinging it around by its hindquarters until they snapped. And he fell panting to the grass, laughing and cheering for that crippled and broken thing to stand, to try to stand, to try to get away. It could not run and had nowhere to go. Twelve. Something screaming across the sky. A helicopter or plane. Lights on its ender belly, thunder in its wings, a black tower of smoke and snow glaring down at me. Thirteen. Sarah asked me to come inside and say hello. To come and sit, hold her hand, feel her voice expand in a little paunch of gut, phonemes of satin tracing invisible panty lines of breath. Fourteen. 
mounds of expressive farce, our state of love, that state of being as we've become something lacking in the way we fuck today. A face the working lady, a clit again, lady again, fuck, hands punching, fuck, legs tense, fuck, kicking pillows and blankets away with a throaty fuck, fuck, fuck. The word itself overused, fatigued, running to an ache of an overlong stay, a too long fuck, past the point of pleasure to unlubricate pain like everything I read into the fuck. Pages and pages, reports and reports, an entire chapter of research missing, rape. I love you, I love you too. Fifteen. Rubbing hips, thinking of Stalin. Working my hand between the cupped halves of her ass. Stop it. What? There are people, there are always people. Fuck, it occurred. Sometime in 45, not an overused thing, merely blowing off steam. Sixteen. Sarah pushing me away, changing topic, asking about work, about writing. How is the research going? Fine. Did you find anything exciting? Some things, like what? Just things, just things? Yeah, what? Sarah, what? I don't want to talk about it. Why? Are you glad we got married? Are you? Stalin in a leather suit, nipples pink, raised lumps and teeth, biting down, cutting skin, snorting poppers, rubbing thumbs across eyelids, pushing down, ow, ow, that hurts, it's poverty and war, and ugly history of running numerals. So many dead, so many wounded, so many rations of Russian vodka appropriate on the march, a hundred kilos of a hundred proof missing in action, strapped to our waists in camps and tanks, planning to go around, back to the dance floor, back to people, arrangements of bodies like Stalin's lists. Realized in their execution, their recall, Uncle Carlisle, conservative Republican, and Jeannie, celiac disease, no gluten. Cousin John, loud, roommate Tia, single, best friend Bob, divorced, single Kimmy seat with Bob, drinking, dancing, toasting until 5 a.m. when we received orders to stand down, the groundskeepers and building managers telling us to leave, pointing to Snowy Road saying, drive safe, I don't want to go. I know, Sai. I said, I don't want to go, I know, I, want, I heard you. Another screaming across the sky. Rocket fire, digging holes in the earth, filling pits with shrapnel, shoes and coats, the cadavers of men stumbling outside, leaning into the cold. Stalin tells me we will not advance today, or yesterday, or the day before. Historians tell a story about the siege of Moscow. How one day during a blizzard, a German soldier rode his motorbike from the front lines almost to the very heart of the city. There's no official record of this, no reports log. The Russians who shot him have no name for the man, and there is no explanation for his flight. What about war? What? You were saying about war. No, I wasn't. I heard you. No, I wasn't. I heard you. A car backfire in the parking lot. People jumping. Always attack. The party is strong. Running from Moscow. Shouting at head like Silas. Stormtroopers in rented tuxedos and wingtips rushing past. Come back here, Silas. Mouths red. Faces red. What's... Where's he going? Sprinting across. I don't know. Huddled, heaving, explosive earth. I'll get him. Scratching at arms. No, I'll go. Screaming of rockets. Silas. Unbuckling pants. Taking off shoes. We need to go, Silas. Digging for cover. Snow angels, curling with soaked fumes of metal heating. Do you hear me, Sai? Duh, dig. What are you doing? Digging. Sai, Doug, Silas. Eighteen, pits like spent teeth, empty fillings. Nazi jugal, dug out of the mouth, screaming wretched cadavers. Sai, stop it. Lines under shirt, ow, across chest, stop. Behind ears, I said stop it, get a kiss. Nineteen, urine soaked rainwaters, mudged with words. Someone, snow red in violence, a push. Someone, help, be firm. Never lose strength, take not one step back. The ground smelling like compost, like mildew. A goat nearby, standing in the snow, coat ratty with mange, eyes full of maggots. She can't get away, someone broke her legs. Fly tricky with frost, pants stiff with blood. More words on ass, backs of thighs, across shins, infected stumps of knees, bleeding ink. Silas, stop. Stalin, that old philanderer, observing, making suggestions. Stop, no help, stop. We're here, here, come here, laughing, but can't tell for sure. Jamming an entire fist and nose, trying to find hidden text. Apocrypha, steel, a woman or a goat. A collection of untitled works pointing north, outside the shelling, to confused lights. A blanketed snow-white verge, my god, what happened? Running from Moscow, what happened? Before the world wakes, what happened? Define, Sarah, what happened? Bubbling campfire, Sarah, oil bubbling oil, what happened? Running for walls past tank traps and troop bivouacs and sleepy-eyed Russians. Bleeding nose and screaming goat, smiling away, what happened? And fish, and what happened? An old bear in his cave, what happened? What happened? Fuck. Running past brown blurbs on walls, neon swirls of action, pits of motion like gravities in space collapsing into one perfect impact. When an alert sentry spots me and shouts, there he is, there he goes, and I turn my head, stub my toe, trip and fall. What is observable, what is real, that moment of death made sudden, synapse firing, dendrons electric going down, but not into sets of rounds of lives around, arranged within impossible folds of singularity, Siri, Sarah, Andy, and Beth finding me, there he is. Death, adjustment, stiffening of hair, relaxation of tremors, and imposition of grace on that moment when inertia separates foot from ground, tumbling into soft iron teeth welded into cross beams. Hundreds and thousands of Soviet writers lining up in cramped rooms to pour over text, redacting fuck, coming up with a new lexicon of fuck. The writer, as Joe says, the true engineer of the human soul's fuck becoming just a little fun with a woman. 
hitting my head. Last kicking breath, an indication of perverse terror. Wondering if they'll fuck me once I'm dead. If the shadowy figure of the guard approaching will fall on me and begin licking the blood from my lips, making erotic Slavic sounds while I bleat and whimper and try to crawl on busted bloody knees. Sarah instead, appearing, covered in scrapes, nose bleeding, holding a shoulder strap in one shaking cold red in hand, staring at some incredibly fragile space between us, then laughing until it hurts, laughing until it bleeds, laughing until all the colors are gray and white and red and everything sounds like screaming. I want to go. I never want to leave. Thanks. Wow. Reminds me of a, a Stalin story my mother told me. <laughs> so tell it, tell it's it. a great story. So my mother's like five or six when Stalin dies. She's in uh, the the dining room of the, the apartment alone, and the radio's on. And the announcer asks everyone to stand up for a moment. Um, they're going to play a, a song for Stalin, and so she, as like a five-year-old, stands up by herself in the room because you know, to honor Stalin. And I have one about my father doing something similar, but you, that's over here. Uh, okay. Well, uh, next. Anne Gillespie, our next Olympian. <laughs> that's right. And that's what you, right. That's what that is. And what most of you don't know, and. And I'm going to introduce you to her now, even though it's thundering and lightning outside. It's thundering and lightning. Anne also came to us as a coach. She was a Olympian coach of the pro skating team. Let's give her a hand because everybody wants to hear me. That's why she was made in pro and, and defective. And so we, we're now the lucky recipients of all these Olympians. You make none of them synchronized swimmers. Everyone loves a synchronized swimmer. Well, you know, and the police too. <laughs> all right, okay. Straight man. Thank you. Anne holds a BA from Middlebury College in Russian language. Here you go. A Master's of Philosophy from Oxford University in England in Russian and East European Studies. Uh, and an MFA in creative writing from Converse College in South Carolina, and worked for ABC News for 10 years and for the Los Angeles Times for five years. She is interested in 19th century realism. Yay, realism. <laughs> Modernism. Yay. Russian literature. <laughs> and the development of the novella as a distinct literary form. Please welcome Angela. Konstantinov 
failed his foreign intelligence training. His instructors in Moscow were unanimous in their assessment that Dmitry would make a terrible spy. Nonetheless, the decade being the golden 90s, the year 1993, and espionage having been downgraded in favor of improved relations with the decadent West, Dmitry was dispatched to the Russian embassy in Washington, D.C. as a junior press spokesman. For what he lacked as a spy, he made up for as a diplomat. He had an open disposition that set him apart from the pinched gray bureaucrats who abounded at the embassy. His English was more fluent and contemporary than that of his colleagues, and reporters looking for sound bites soon began requesting him by name. His superiors at the foreign ministry were pleased to project a more modern, less Soviet image, and Dmitry made an unusually swift descent to the position of press attaché. A month into his second year in Washington, Dmitry was driving along I-395, returning from a news conference in Crystal City, when instead of taking a left after crossing the Potomac, he decided to keep going straight. He passed through the dis district and on into Maryland. His intention was simply to take in the scenery, to gauge his surroundings. In more than a year in Washington, he had rarely ventured outside the Beltway, and never any great distance. On this particular afternoon, he got as far as Baltimore. He drove around the city for a while, lost his way, asked for directions from someone who turned out to be a prostitute, and then headed back to D.C. <coughs> Nothing he had seen struck him as different from Washington. The same streets, the same traffic, the same crowds. The following Thursday, he left the embassy compound for, for what he thought was a quick trip to the shopping mall and ended up in Philadelphia. Here again, though the landscape during some of the drive was pleasant enough, and the city, of course, held a certain historical interest, he found no fix for the mysterious traveling affliction that had befallen him. The next week he was more deliberate. He set out on Saturday afternoon and drove the Beltway, waiting for inspiration. At the exit for Route 64, he felt a tingling in his fingertips and turned off. He had no map, but he could tell from his position left of the sun that he was headed in a southwesterly direction. As he drove, the scenery became greener and more undulating. He knew what he was looking for when he saw it, a truck stop. He pulled in among a row of massive vehicles. His palms were sweating, for he had seen the film Deliverance. <laughs> <laughs> but he had also seen the instructive tale Moscow on the Hudson and felt prepared to face an American audience. <laughs> When he walked through the door of the truck stop in his chino trousers, burgundy colored Ralph Lauren polo shirt, and Sperry topsider shoes, he was not disappointed by the reaction. There were about half a dozen men sitting at a long bar and two men playing pool in a murky corner. They all stopped talking to stare at him. He walked up to the bar and called to the bartender in a loud voice, Hello, I have come from Russia and I would like a real American beer. <laughs> Why anyone would want an American beer when they could have Canadian or Mexican or German was a mystery to Dimitri, but mentioning that would, of course, have been counterproductive. Everyone continued to stare. He saw confusion on several of the faces. The bartender slowly walked up to Dimitri's end of the bar. Well, we got Bud, we got Miller, we got Coors. I will have Bud. He made his Russian accent thicker than it really was, but not so thick that they couldn't understand him. He beamed a smile to all sides. The bartender placed a bottle and a glass in front of him. Even the pool players had stopped playing to watch, leaning on their cues. He knew enough not to use the glass. He raised the bottle to his lips, tipped back his head, and took three lengthy swallows. He then belched loudly, held the bottle up in the air, and cried, I love America! <laughs> the truck stop erupted in cheers. <laughs> From all sides, large, sweaty men surrounded the country, clapping him on the back, shaking his hand. Let me get you another one of those, son, said a man of around 45, weighing in at no less than 130 kilos, Dimitri estimated, and another Budweiser appeared on the bar. Dimitri felt compelled to finish off his first bottle and start on the proffered gift. What's your name, son? The big man asked. My name is Dimitri, sir. He thought it best to maintain a tone of intense enthusiasm. He stuck out his hand. And what is your name, sir, if I may ask? I'm Ray, 
The man's hand felt like a warm, raw pot roast in Dimitri's. <laughs> so, you say you're from Russia? That is correct, Dimitri said. Boy, you must be glad to have got out of there. Ray looked around at the other men, who nodded and murmured their appreciation. Dimitri could feel the alcohol entering his bloodstream. You must be glad to be in the USA, huh? Ray said. Dimitri realized he was being cute. Yes, he said, I am very happy. Here in America, everything is so, hmm, so. His mental faculties were rapidly deserting him. Everything is so, so free, Ray offered helpfully. <laughs> yes, free, Dimitri cried. In America, everyone is free to, hmm, to drink beer and, uh, and to say whatever they want, Ray suggested further. Dimitri cursed himself for not having done more research before embarking on this trip. <laughs> you are right. In America, I can say whatever I want. Long live President Clinton. <laughs> he held up his bottle once again, but this time there were no takers. He drained the rest of his beer in the chilly silence. <laughs> The other men looked towards Ray. But Ray was apparently a gentle soul and forgave Dimitri his faux pas. What was your name again, he said? Dimtri? Yes, Dimtri. <laughs> well, Dimtri, you want to see my truck? I would be honored, Dimitri said. <laughs> he spent about an hour in the parking lot, inspecting the riggings and cargo holds and climbing up into the cabs of Ray's 18-wheeler, then Dwayne's Mac, then Bob's semi. He sobered up somewhat, but the truckers wouldn't let him get into his car until he consumed two cups of disgusting yet highly effective coffee from Bob's thermos. As they said their goodbyes, Ray offered some friendly advice. You're going to need to get yourself some blue jeans, Dimitri, and some shirts without those little horses on them. <laughs> he rubbed the stubble on his chin and looked down at Dimitri's feet. And now don't take this the wrong way, son, but I got to tell you, in America, only fairies wear shoes with no socks. <laughs> Dimitri nodded. It occurred to him that Ray probably didn't think much of the Kennedys. And indeed, <laughs> as, <laughs> and indeed, as he pulled out of the truck stop parking lot, the truckers still waving in his rearview mirror, it seemed impossible that he was on the same continent as Hyannis Fort or Martha's Vineyard or even Washington, D.C. In fact, if he ignored the hilliness of the surrounding terrain and the absence of birch trees, Dimitri could easily have believed himself headed not to the American capital, but to Moscow, returning from a sleepy weekend at a countryside dacha, his skin still infused with the smell of hay drying in the fields and with the warmth of unadulterated sunlight. Thank you. Long live President. Uh, have appeared. <laughs> His reviews have appeared in the Volta, 
while his poems, I'm going to stop for a second. I'll, I see some of my former undergraduate students here who are looking for MFA students. These are the people you talk to tonight. Okay, ask them how, who was nice to them where. His reviews. <laughs> sorry. His reviews have appeared in the Volta, while his poems have appeared in Spork and are forthcoming from Greenland. Please welcome Ben Levin. Infirmaries have perfect hands. A headache can be kind. You say last night you dreamed you were awake with an insect in your ear. The doctor taking a look, cracking a joke. The shift clock blinks. From your bed, you measure the exact sound and time it takes to get to where the door. You don't recognize me anymore, waiting as you are for the footsteps to come back with a little paper cup of water. Parallax. You are somewhere in my picture window, propping up your telescope in the darkening backyard. What's that word for when the thing you focus on shows less than what's around it? I mean, my dad seems dim from where I am. The, the star metaphor holds only so long. Though follow any metaphor too deep and you get stuck. I know. Objects are just themselves, my vague father. I should feel responsible. The barely lit tip of your cigar, firefly from here, articulates some gesture I can't read. I try to draw you through the phrase, my father propping up his telescope in the darkening backyard, but it doesn't work. Shadow of a sentence now, my memory already in the making. Why can't I keep up with what I see? Or what's the trick that once I write it down, it sounds wrong, a dead metaphor? I know, I know. The poem should be one step ahead of me. The poem should be, the poem should feel real. Exervia. Seal the crawl space and plug the cracks against the bitter winter. Drug the dog before the fireworks. You cannot catch a cold by being cold. Three brown trout, wrapped in wet newspaper. Is it bloody? Will the wheels freeze solid? I cannot wait for the skin to turn blue and to show you my matchstick collection. The prepositional phrase contains no crucial information cross it out. My name is not a body, but it can be. Cross it out. There are wrong and right ways to be good. When earthquake crawl beneath this desk, cover your head in your hands. When fire, feel the door before you open it. Now open it. A small canine nearby remembers he's God is dragging down the morphine moon, and isn't it nice to know you are alone? 
a bullfrog at the bottom of a bucket. Spring is over. No more movies playing in the park. The swimming pool grown thick with fluoride and chlorine. The children rub their eyes raw, and not anyone can find a piece of bottle at the bottom cutting people's toes. The contestants roll their pants up to their knees and remove their shoes. You can see the grapes crush through the glass. You can smell the smoke. Running in place, you'll go nowhere. The gates will be closed in 15 minutes. Please be prepared to walk calmly into the odorous and black air. I shine my cell phone light on the tarantula. Text a picture with the caption, nature. No one says anything. <laughs> I am alone and in nature. No one says anything. <laughs> Discard the skin left on the cutting board, the food gone brown in the refrigerator. Mother's clear containers labeled pasta, raisins, rice. There are toenail clippings in the lawn and bees in the screen. A prize somewhere in the cereal box. You just need to dig. In the corner of an eye, he could not go back. We tried lugging him over the chain link fence. His shirt caught. It was obvious why. He had no parents anyone could see. The collar tore. His father kept transforming, but not enough to matter. The water under boardwalk board, so it's impossible to know who's moving. He bought a bag of crickets to feed the iguana. Inside the bag, the crickets scurried like the bag burned. He hit his brother. He learned he had no brother. All that time, whom had he been fighting? The phone rang. It was obvious why. He powdered them with protein. He poured them into the tank, but the damn thing wouldn't eat. So they sang. Instead, he set his shirt on fire in the driveway. I remember that chapter. I was there, twin to no one. You see the picture when you're in the picture. I walked in late and looked around. Are we married yet? I could use a strong drink right about now. What do you say? What I saw, snow everywhere. A playground lost in white. It's warm in here. I should take my shirt off. I had the strangest dream just now. Flakes were dangling into my coffee cup and we were being married. I would like to make you happy but you're too particular. Being particular has its benefits. I'm sorry I'm so tired all the time. Maybe try taking my job off for a change. Works for me. Picture this. Christmas cards for all our relatives. Clean clothes on the bed, a fire burning. You were sleeping, so I went to get coffee. Do you want some? In the cold, it helps to get naked when there is someone to lie down with. I'm sorry if I have a one-track mind. I am learning what it means to be distinctive. I like it here, but what I really want is time. Birds fly toward reflect. Oh, sorry, I forgot the title. What will heal will get forgotten. Birds fly into ref birds fly toward reflection. Sorry. <laughs> okay. We shut the door to keep the dog inside. Fellow animal of fierce routine. Time to clean the table. Time to lie down in the dark. 
the halls we walk lose half their shade with morning. And I'll just read one more. Uh, this is country music. White men crawl through fields with the earth in their ears. I carefully remove the catheter and place it on the tray. I'm not a boy, I'm a cowboy. If you listen, you can hear God barking through the trees, the law at his side. Listen, no one's clean. You want to kill something? Feel a little insect in your chest? It takes no time. He's hunting you down with a guitar. Thanks.